excited for you to invite me into the slow factory. And of course, we came into the design studio slash daycare <laughs> slash, you know, pizza boxes everywhere. So I'm feeling <laughs> as... It's Friday, it's Friday. We don't eat pizza every day. <laughs> well, as, and I'm from the South, as we've already said before, uh, I feel right at home. We talked, to, of course, in the introduction, you know, I mentioned about you being from the country of Lebanon, uh, which of course is the border. A lot of it's the border, it sits on the border of Syria and other countries, Turkey and everything else is close to Turkey. Uh, but I want to know, you know, being born in a country in Lebanon, you know, and moving around and, you know, moving to Canada, like, what were some of the curiosities that you grew up having as a kid? Um, yes, that's, uh, that's funny because we. The, my first memory, and I just, uh, I, I keep saying this um, as I, I told my mom, my first memory of growing up was when I, um, uh, we, were, we were leaving Lebanon, we were fleeing, and I took all of my plush toys with me and she had warned me, just take one with you. And I was like, no, I want all of them. And we were running in the airport and trying to, you know, because we were leaving as a, on, on a refugee status. And all I remember is looking back and seeing all the plush toys, you know, falling from my arms. And the only one that I managed to save is an elephant that ended up burning on, on a, on the heater in Montreal, <laughs> but um, it's a funny thing because my first memory of living in Lebanon is literally very close to, you know, war and all of that. But I don't remember the war. I just remember, you know, running around, being, you know, brought places. Being a kid. Yeah, I mean, being a kid, but very much around. I mean, there was war at the time, and we would have to go into the the shelters mm -hmm. and and yeah my first vivid vivid memory is a few snippets of that of what happened during then and leaving yeah. so I don't remember much of Lebanon at the time but then we went and you know we lived in Montreal mm -hmm. um, and then we went back to Lebanon at the mm -hmm. end of the war so curiosities I don't know I mean the first winter in Montreal was crazy we were like what this is so cool does it and snow in Lebanon? It does snow in Lebanon uh -huh. on the mountains, but it's not like Montreal. I mean, Montreal <laughs> is freezing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was... As a child, all I wanted was to fit in, and then I realized growing up that actually you don't need to fit in, you know? And there's yeah. this beautiful quote by Dr. Seuss. Seuss? I don't know if I say it right. <laughs> it's that, uh, you know, why fitting when you were born to stand out? And I have it like on my kid's door because I feel this is liberating to think that, you know, don't try too hard to fit in. You don't have yeah. to. <laughs> so what were some of the things that, you know, being, being an immigrant, um, what were some of the things, and you know, immigrating from like several countries, like what were some of the things that you, that your, that your parents did to keep the family together since you guys had to separate you know yourself from your home country so what were some of the things that your parents did to like keep you guys together you know the funny thing is i don't think they were very conscious of what they were doing i think they were very young in their 20s and they were just trying to manage and cope my mom cooked all the time lebanese food and it's not because she wanted like it was not a conscious decision of like i want them to eat lebanese food it was literally like that's what she knows and and it was delicious and we grew up eating a lot of Lebanese food. Everything was constantly homemade. We, we would go to restaurants, but it would mostly be her cooking because she loves cooking also. She's pretty good at it. So I think through the food of my, you know, of my heritage, I grew close and closer and closer to that culture without, I think, them being very aware of what they were doing. And also I really saw them reinvent themselves so many times and it was so inspiring physically with their languages that they've learned uh, my dad had uh, you know uh, at bottega in montreal and then and the gas station and it would be vandalized constantly and be, you know we would get like immigrants go home and it was and you know calls from the cops it was very difficult in the 80s to be an immigrant, an immigrant yeah. that comes from How the east how does that process go from, you know, things such as the Civil War that started in 1975 in the, in the country of Lebanon, and you have to move, you know, to uh, another country that has safer conditions, like, 
is it a decision that you you just get up and just move or like I mean how does that how does that you know a lot of people did not leave and I really respect and admire the people who managed to stay in Beirut and keep their homes a lot of people refused to leave no matter what my grandparents did not leave my aunts did not leave um, my uncles left we left some people had to go we had to go there was nothing left for us you know but other people managed to stay when we went back in the 90s when the war officially ended and there was a ceasefire the people who had left were not seen as you know they were not looked up to you know we were mostly I mean, not the adults, but the kids at school, we were treated like traitors almost, you know, especially my generation of kids. The younger ones were just like whatever, especially because they were able to, you know, just adapt quicker. And I was 13 when I went back to Lebanon. I did not speak Arabic very well, and I certainly did not read and write it because I was at school in Montreal, you know. And um, I mean, I spoke it, but very broken, and I didn't know all the cool slang, and I just did not belong there. And also, and I felt like I did not want to go back there. It was just so, um, just, I don't know, shocking. At 13, you know, you don't want to just <laughs> leave your friends and go to the Middle East in a country. So probably the negative, so probably you would say probably the negative that you got out of moving and, you know, out of, you know, being an immigrant was the, going back and having to handle a different type of peer pressure. Because peer pressure to me when I was growing up was, as you said in the beginning, fitting in, wearing the Barbie, the, the cool shoes, the cool sneakers. That's right. That's, I mean, and you know, having not being able to like to be picked upon, that's, I think that's our reality of, in America. But to say that, you know, you had to go back to your country and you couldn't read or write of the native language, yeah, I mean, wherever I've been, I have not been at home, and that comes from, you know, and that fed my work, and I turned this into art, and I turned this into slow factory, and I turned this into inspiration, but when I was growing up, it was pain, it was painful for me, wherever I went, in Montreal, I didn't feel at home, I didn't feel at home in Lebanon, I, li I lived in Paris, it was certainly not my home, although I do speak French fluently, I, and the only place, it's gonna sound super cheesy, but the only place I feel at home is in New York. And when I came here in 2008, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the first time I have peace of mind. Of I feel like I belong. <laughs> it was very, very powerful. And I was yeah. like, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be. Uh -huh. Then I lived here. Then I had to go again. I, I had a yeah. very nomadic life throughout my life. So even before, um, like, even, even at the moment that you had to go back to Lebanon, um, did you did you stay there until you got of, of an age where you could go out on your own, like 18, 19 years old? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I lived in Lebanon from 13 till 18, mm -hmm. and as soon as I was 18, I'm like, bye, I'm leaving. Did you go to college? <laughs> yes, I, I mean, they don't know, it wasn't really college because the system that I went through is a French system, so after, when I was 18, it was time for university, so I went to... Uni. Uh, yeah, uni. <laughs> you know. And then I went to art school in Paris because I wanted to become an artist, I wanted to, that was mainly what I was drawing, doing, drawing, I was drawing, uh -huh. but I was doing my whole um, like uh, life really, since I was a child all the way till I was a teen, I was known for drawing, I was known, it was my way of coping and dealing and um, I was drawing, drawing, painting, drawing, painting all the time and then when I was in Lebanon all I wanted to do was to continue with that and I dedicated my whole weekend for that. And I met a French teacher there in Lebanon who taught me at her house. And she's like, you have to go to Paris, you have to become an artist. And I was like, yes, I feel it. <laughs> and, then, and then my mom was like, no way, no way. We did not struggle this much for you to blow it up into an artist. And you're not going to, and it was a big fight. I had to beg them. And then she talked to them and she's like, you know, she could have a career. And I was like, please, I cried so much. And then they said, okay, fine, you get one year in Paris. And I was like, okay. 
and I'm gonna so make the you. best out of it. So I did one year and then I applied to become a designer in Paris to stay there and I was rejected because they were like, no, it's not design what you're doing, it's fine arts. You know? Fashion designer or? No, just regular, like graphic design. Graphic design, Not okay. regular because there's no regular, but just graphic design. <laughs> and uh, they're like, uh, I, I presented my portfolio in front of many juries and then um, they were like, no, this is too fine art. You should go to the Beaux-Arts or, you know, you should do art, but you're not a designer. And I, that crushed me so badly. I cried so much around the Seine, you know, the Seine in Paris. The, the mm, I haven't the went. I haven't. I haven't went. And to Paris cried yet. and cried and talked to my mentor there. I was like, oh, I can't believe it! Oh my god! <laughs> and then, despite all that, I became a designer, and uh, and I, I did it by myself after mm. that. I just so graphic design. I mean, I started with graphic yeah. design, then moved into interaction design, user experience design, and now I'm in fashion design. I have to ask you about. Um, user experience design it, well, inter interactive or interaction what, what does that mean for like to be an interactive designer and user experience so I'm yeah. yeah so you see this interface you have right there that's mm -hmm. recording our thing right that interface was designed by a designer who's called is either a user experience designer or an interactive designer because you're interacting with this interface wow. And okay. user experience is a designer that focuses on the usability of a product. So for example, you you knew where to click to record, you know where to click to stop and all okay. that. And so a designer who does user experience puts these things together on an interface and makes it like becomes based, makes it human. Makes it wow. So it's like a it's a, an ambassador between the technology and humans. Yeah, because I started out, of course, like I started, we uh, probably like you as well, we started out putting the floppy disk in into the computer and waiting and waiting and then for it to interact and stuff like that, you have to find your way and stuff like that. So that's, that's, that's very, very interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting that, like, there's people, I, I'm, because in my mind, I'm thinking like, how a computer, like, you know, the CPU system is, and everything else hardware system is, like, built, is just built by one person, and it's just like, you build a computer, you build everything else into it, mm -hmm. but, yeah, yeah. That's it's a big team, sometimes when there's a, you know, big project, you have many user experience designers collaborating mm -hmm. together, and each one does a button, and anyway, that's so a how, button. Uh, how did you, so you're a graphic designer, and, you know, coming into user experience, and interactive, like, how did you go about continuously diversifying your knowledge base? So I uh, grew up with the internet and I really embraced the internet mm -hmm. age and everything that I've learned was from the internet really um, and so uh, I, I come from a culture of open knowledge and part of it is whatever you learn you, you give back so I started a blog and whatever I learned in design I would just like summarize and put online or link to different resources that I found um, all of my side projects I would take pictures and just like upload them on that blog it would be sort of like a like an open source you know travel Bad, you know, yeah, whatever between you my journeys and everything, and yeah. so and through that work with open knowledge and open um, data, I I started working randomly with Creative Commons, Creative Commons Montreal, which uh, where I um, began working um, as a community lead there, mm -hmm. and so uh, raising awareness about the open license and teaching artists and designers about the open license and throwing events and. Um, and I knew that the first people who signed up with, I mean, not who signed up, but who um, released their work under Creative Commons were, you know, the scientific knowledge and NASA was there and the Wikipedia was like joined and I felt like, oh my gosh, we have to do something with these images at some point. Like that was in the back of my head because, you know, it was such a rich resource. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my how God. did you, well, how did you, because I'm, because in Alabama we have, I went to school in uh, Huntsville, because in, in the United States you have Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama, and you have in Houston, Texas, they have like the NASA stations and stuff like that, the NASA Space and Rocket Center, mm -hmm. whatever like that. NASA is cool to me, <laughs> but I don't remember anybody growing up that said NASA is like, you know, like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> 
like you know like uh, you know maybe like the astronaut maybe like the astronauts uniform like the astronauts uniforms and stuff like that but i never remember as a kid that nasa was like the coolest thing but to you you you're like you you work in creative commons and like you're looking at all these different like images and stuff like that what did you see within like okay. NASA that but was it also good? comes back from also my childhood. I was terrible at math and everyone told me so also. Okay, and I would have like zeros all the time. I did not understand <laughs> math at all. It was the worst anxiety inducing like class. Mm -hmm. But my dream when they asked you what do you want to be when you grow up and I was like astronaut and the teachers would be like, ha, you gotta be good in math for astronaut and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh well, that's what I want to be. I really want to go into space. And I was very fascinated by it from a very young age uh -huh. and very disappointed to find out that actually I can't be an astronaut because I suck in math, you know? Uh -huh. Like really bad, like the worst, the worst. Yeah, I'm science. science. It was science for me. Oh, that's good. Yeah. But I love history. Yeah, so. I, yeah, I love yeah, history yeah, yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, when, you know, I, I, I was always like a sort of a geek in a way because I always loved NASA and science but I felt like I was not allowed to you know do it because mm -hmm. I was not good in math so before even Creative Commons NASA was always something that I looked up to I wanted to be you know I felt like it was the cool group that I can't be mm -hmm. part of and uh, because I don't have the, the you know, what it takes mm -hmm. but turns out I made peace with it and I found a way to work with NASA in another way <laughs> and when they joined with Creative Commons I was the most excited person on the team I was like oh my god we gotta do something with this and everyone's like okay chill out put it on your desktop and I'm like yeah I have it already on my desktop but how can we bring that back outside of the desktop like all these images are immaterial and my idea was like let's make it tangible let's make it material I really felt in my heart that if people were exposed to that kind of beauty and awe, maybe people will be kinder with one another. That's how it really started. Like it was, what if we, we wrap people with, with images of, of the Hubble and the Earth and they br we bring them together, maybe they would stop shooting each other, you know? And it was mainly started as an art so experiment. Having this, so you're having this conversation with, with myself. No, yeah. with myself. Oh, with yourself. Yes, and then I was like, I hope you weren't talking, just talking back to you. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I was talking to people, talking to <laughs> myself, and people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and then you decided to have conversation and everything else like that in your head. And then you decided to like how we do, grew up in the internet, as you say, you decided to tweet it. Yes. And it, oh yes. Yeah. Okay, so wait, this took a few, a few years before I tweeted. So oh, a few wow. years after that, okay, I, a few years, like literally four years later, I, um, uh, even more than that, years. okay, anyway, I had my first kid and then I had a big identity crisis. I'm like, I don't want to work for people anymore. I want to do my own thing. And um, and I went to Lebanon for four months to just like find myself again. And I uh, spent four months there and I had like a notepad and with ideas. And one of them was print these images of NASA, do something with that. Mm -hmm. So I tweeted, that's when I tweeted. Tweet. Wouldn't that be great to uh, print this image and I put one of them of the Hubble on silk and my very good friend Harper Reed was like do it and then it started to like do it yes wow blah 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 and I was like oh, I gotta do it I gotta do it and then came the emergency of I have to do this right now or someone else is gonna do it because I just tweeted about it and I have to do it I have to do it part of doing it was okay now how do I do it how do I print this and as a you know a designer I was already a very like conscious responsible design was something that I love thinking about the ecosystem of a design thinking about sustainable design I didn't want to print it on something that's polyester or that's going to ruin the planet the whole it called like ecosystem of that product needed to make sense and that's why I you know started my journey into fashion, mm -hmm. into manufacturing, into, or I already knew about slow fashion and the slow food movement and all of that, which I was very much like a, um, a sucker for, I guess, a hipster for, I don't know, <laughs> but it's good, it's good, it's all good, but anyway, so I was already like, oh, I'm eating organic, I'm not buying fast <laughs> fashion, and then I'm like, okay, so how am I going to make this, because I have to think about that, I have to, you know, find a way to make it that's sustainable, that's fair trade, that's eco-friendly, and I put so many 
constraints, and that's part of design is navigating constraints. I, I, I started with a bunch of constraints and I was like, okay, how do I get this? Yeah. And then... Now, um, how did, I mean, how did you, did you ever question on being a fashion designer or like how did you actually transition into like, because fashion, I mean, even you doing like being a uh, graphic designer and you know, interactive and user experience, Technology ties into fashion, of course, but being a designer is a whole nother trade. I mean, making and I know, sampling I know. And it was easy for me because you, you, if you know what to look for, you can find it. You know, if you understand the structure, which I already understood. Mm -hmm. Now, I made peace with the impost, imposter syndrome a while ago because I made myself into a designer. So I went through the fact, am I really a designer? Am I an artist? Am I this? Do I have the right to call myself a designer? I don't even have a diploma and that blah, blah, blah. All that I had already dealt with. So when I entered the fashion design, I was like, I'm a fashion designer, I don't care. And then I'm like, I'm gonna figure it out. And I started doing research and I figured out lots of ways when you, I structured it and did research. I imagined how things could be and then I researched how to get there and right. then I researched manufacturing, I talked to people, I interviewed people, I, I just went on, I applied the design process you onto, quest. Yeah, onto quest. my business. I literally like, you know, the discovery phase, the research phase, the user testing phase, the user research phase, everything I applied to my own business and I built it this way, you know what I mean? Mm. Hmm. So I did my research, I talked to people, and then I did tests, I did prototypes, I prototyped with a lot of people. It's, it's very material. interesting that a lot of your great designers are not particularly, they didn't study fashion design. Mm -hmm. Like my two favorite are Tom Ford um, and Ralph Lauren. And of course, I have my, my own reason, whatever like that. But you know, Tom Ford comes from an architecture, mm -hmm. you know, architecture background, and then Ralph Lauren comes from just, you know, I'm just gonna do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna do it. And and it's amazing how <clears throat> the now with the um, the birth of so many different companies, mm -hmm. and, and now in the 21st century, that you find that there are people that come from a outside standpoint of view in fashion that are coming into fashion and establishing, you know, their own viewpoint and their own perspective and also their own uh, way of how they do things to produce materials, produce fabric, produce uh, products. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you come up, you talked about you were the like slow fashion and everything, Amy, the company, Slow okay, Factory. So, yeah. Slow Factory, I was brainstorming with uh, actually my husband because I used to work for him that's how we met uh, long story short we were brainstorming for a client and then we're like he wanted a name with fast 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 that was before the babies so I was still working as a designer he wanted something fast and I was like how about slow factory and then we look it up and we, the, the domain name was available so I'm like <gasps> we gotta buy this name I had a very strong feeling about it I'm like I need this name please 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 so we bought it and he bought it for me and then that was like my first URL that I owned apart from my own blog and then I I started like collecting URLs, but that's another story. And then a few <laughs> years later, when I tweeted about this, I was like, I'm going to do it under Slow Factory. It makes so much sense because I imagined it be, you know, Slow Factory being a um, factory slowly floating in space, you know, mm -hmm. and then this whole concept of like looking at the big picture and slowing down and looking at the big picture. And it, come, it came with the same vibe and the same philosophy of you know, the prints that I wanted to print and why am I doing this and the slow fashion and to me it made sense, mm -hmm. you know? And, and all of this is being, all this, all these different ideas and everything else is being constructed while you were living in Canada. Uh, this, I was in Beirut at the time. In Beirut, Yeah, okay. I, this okay. idea started uh, in Beirut and, um, and it came from like a very big like identity crisis, postpartum depression, whatever you want to call it. And I started wanting to connect the dots because my, uh, journey before then had been all over like I started in illustration and then art and then I did interaction design and then I did you know performance art and then I did video and then blah 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 and creative commons and all that and I put it all on a piece of paper and as I was connecting the dots a little bit like a constellation uh -huh. it led me to slow factory it literally like made more sense and it was in a quest of finding integrity and finding who I am and 
I was feeling like depressed. I don't want to do design for other people anymore. And I really, I felt like then we spread out into so many directions and also seen as, oh, she's all over the place. Oh, Celine is crazy. She's all over the place. Like people would describe me like this and it started to bother me. Like I was like, I'm not all over the place. I know where I'm going, you know? I know where I want to go, you know? So anyway, it literally started out of that, you know, introspection amazing. and then connecting the dots like that I was like oh my gosh this is making so much sense you know yeah. but fashion really all right it's a bit it's it's amazing when you 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 kind of you said it very very quickly but it's one thing that we overlook um, is always think about I'm, I just turned 25 and I always just think about my greatest ideas and some of the greatest things happen after even if it's in a situation where you're depressed or you, something hasn't went right, or it's like, like you said, post, you know, post part depression. Two. Yeah, yeah, part two. It's like part two. Part two. And it's, but it's, it's one of those things that even in life and even just outside of business, that a lot of people fear of getting to that point where which you got it with having an identity crisis. <laughs> Being, you know, depression, and also at the same time you had your first kid, and all this other stuff is going on, or whatever like that. So that's another, you know, that's another like low within itself. But just, but you still had, um, you still have something about you that you wanted to like move forward. Um, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people are afraid to even get to that point, mm -hmm. and then they don't know what to do after, you know, after the fact of the matter. I mean, I think now I'm 33, so I'm a little older. Yeah. But it's good. I like to be older. I can't wait to have white hair. Um, oh, wow. No, really. I, I can't. It's beautiful to grow. And um, as I'm growing, I realize that when I would feel sad and depressed, which I've been struggling with my whole life, this depression, anxiety, I think we all do in a way, I used to fight that feeling. Mm -hmm. And only recently, I decided to embrace that feeling and embrace my fears and 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 kind of like have tea with them, you know, or like coffee, whatever. And I realized that fear, anxiety, it comes at a time where you, it maybe says something to you, you know, it has a message for you in a way. When I get anxiety and fear and I get panic attacks a lot and, um, and recently I decided, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Tell me what's going on. Why are you scared like this? Like sitting with it and really talking with, not talking with them, but like just surrendering, surrender and accepting and going with it and literally kind of being at peace with the fact that maybe that's it. I'll, I'll die right now. I'm going to die. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to go right now and just listen, go with that flow. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much doing that recently and it has brought me to a point of inner peace yeah. and I've had less and less panic attacks, less and less anxiety. I still do, it's normal, I'm not saying I'm like, kind of like a guru, talk to you, so you have to but talk. I'm just saying that I'm, yeah, I'm just at peace with those messages. I feel like it's telling me something, something that I am not supposed to be doing right now or mm -hmm. I get them where I am trying to do too much for what, what are you doing, what are, and looking within, and most of the time it comes from me not loving what I am, what I am now, without the company, without these achievements, without success, why do you not love yourself, you don't need all this, and when I realized that, I realized that it really comes from lack of self-love and self-confidence that we all struggle with, we all are born to you know, not our, we were born confident because I see my kids, they're just flawless. And then with society and whatever, life and education, we lose that connection with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And part of my journey right now is literally to spend a lot of time with myself and understand, you know, what am I doing? You know, why and yeah. in a more peaceful kind of wow. connected way. I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. what I'm doing, but that's, it's just, so, I'd rather make this, I don't know. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Sorry if it's too deep, but that's really No, 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 no. <laughs> um, hmm. So, <clears throat> so even looking at, 
So even looking at like when you're starting the company Slow Factory and when you as a designer, except I have background, I went to school for design or whatever like that. And you're always like before you even get to the point of creating something, you always want to create, you know, designers always want to create something that's meaningful, you know, something that stands out, something that sets you apart. But out of all the different uh, categories within apparel, you chose scarves. And, and, you know, of course, like people when they think of scarves, people think of Hermes and, yeah. you know, um, all the like different big brands or whatever like that. But you decided to take NASA and combine it with scarves and everything else and have some type of meaning into it. Why did you choose scarves out of all the different categories you could have chose? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm a scarf girl. I've always, also, it's part of my culture, whether you're Muslim or not. Mm -hmm. In Lebanon and in the Middle East, you wear scarves, you know, there's AC and, and outside it's like 100 degrees and you go into a cold place because everything has AC or air conditioning oh. and you wrap yourself with a scarf. We also have an idea that a bit superstitious that the cold enters your body so you always have a scarf with you literally um, you know at the beach we wrap ourselves with large surrounds that eventually we turn into scars if there's AC or whatever and <laughs> AC is the problem no I'm kidding but it, it, it and it's, it was something that we always have. Like the mm -hmm. scarves was something always part no matter mm -hmm. the, the season we always carry a scarf also of course I'm a big fan of Hermes I, at the time I was like, you know, saving up to buy my first MS and I was like, oh my gosh, and on eBay looking at prices. Saving, wow, wow. No, because Saving. it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, and when I had my first child, uh, my mom gave me a silk scarf that she had received when I was born. It was the brand Celine, you know, the Celine brand. Mm -hmm. And she named me Celine. <laughs> and then uh, my dad, when I was born, gave her a Celine scarf a square um. silk scarf and when I gave birth she had saved it I had never seen her wearing it and it and she gave it to me and I was like oh my god it was just like because I was like oh I want to make something made, you know, no they, they make scarves yeah, yeah, yeah. for eyewear or whatever uh, but, bags yeah. mostly yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, no they do I mean they all make oh, scarves wow. but I guess I don't know because I guess he bought her that because it was Celine it was my name blah 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 mm -hmm. and then um, uh, uh, when I when she gave it to me and it was intact in such a good condition, I thought, oh my God, I want to make something that's going to be passed on generations, and I want to create something that lasts. I want to create something that's good quality, and let's start simple. Let's start with and also the images were were square or rectangle, but I thought of a square scarf as the canvas of those images. What if we could touch the art? What if we can wrap ourselves with the art and this idea of canvas where I came from, from like, you know, connecting the dots mm -hmm. with my heritage. I was like, let's do, let, let me do a scarf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the easiest for me. So to how did you go about, so how did you go about sourcing the fabrics? It, you know, because you, you said already, you were already hip to the, the slow fashion and, um, and a lot of, um, so it has to be eco-friendly now. So how did you go about sourcing fabrics that were eco-friendly and you know not harming the environment? Well, I thought of silk as just an instinct that when I did my research, I realized that silk was you know very eco-friendly. Um, now some vegan might say it's cruel, and it's cruel, but so is the world. The world is cruel, and uh, and it is the least um, the one that that hurts the least the, the, the planet when you want like something soft and transparent like that, a, a material that's soft and transparent. And I wanted something that was made from the earth, literally. And the worms make those silk, the, the silkworms make the silk, and to me that made so much sense. Like I needed to find silk, I needed to find good silk. And I started a journey looking for silk. And my journey landed me eventually in Italy, in Como, where it was for centuries, um, um, you know, the the place where people manufactured and print, made silk. Mm -hmm. And there's actually in Como a silk museum, 
and it's beautiful. And it's, it, now the business is slower there because everybody moved to Asia, but they still manufacture there, and I wanted to work with with those mills and, and those those factories. So even the images, satellite images of NASA and everything else like that, did you have to purchase a license to actually use the images for? No, for, because for NASA? these images are considered open data, they're considered scientific images, and they are released under Creative Commons with a license that allows for commercial use and for, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a CC license. So okay. they are available. Some of them are available. Some of them don't allow commercial use. So you have to know which one would. Which ones? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So when you first started, when you first started uh, Slow Factory, and you started to, where were you at? Were you in America or were you in Canada or were you? In no. Beirut? So then I went back to Montreal after okay. I like scoped everything and and I was like, let's start. So I went back to Montreal for. Uh, I guess a few months mm -hmm. and then I celebrated the first year of Slow Factory in New York because I had moved to New York again. Okay. And now I'm here for good because I signed a lease over here on my store <laughs> and I have to <laughs> stay here for at least three years. <laughs> so what is part? So did you did you have any uh, success of you know before you moved to New York in Canada, starting the company? In I mean Canada? when we launched and you know, I tweeted about it and it kind of went like, not really viral, but like, we sold out. Mm -hmm. We had a, a short amount, I reprinted, and I moved to New York. And when I moved to New York, I went to Creative Mornings, uh, it was about space, and you know Creative Mornings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was about space, and uh, and I was wearing one of my scarves, and I was like, I made this! And Tina Roth Eisenberg, who is the founder of Creative Mornings, who at the time wasn't a friend, but now became a friend, and a mentor, um, she wrote a blog post about it, and then we sold out completely, and then all the blogs started oh, picking Jesus up, bless. and then it was <laughs> just like crazy, there's something happening, and so I, and then I created a new collection, we shot it, and then again it was picked up by a lot of blogs, and then we sold out, and then I was like, okay, I want to do something more, I want to... The, and then that's when I decided, okay, now every collection is tied with an NGO, mm -hmm. with the work of an NGO. And then we launched Gaza by Night and uh, the Cities by Night collection that was raising awareness about light pollution. But Gaza by Night was funding a Dignity Fund project with um, an NGO that we work with called mm -hmm. Anera. And we were distributing dignity kits for displaced women in Gaza mm -hmm. after the war. And so after that, I worked with the World, uh, uh, world Wildlife, mm -hmm. created a new collection for the World Wildlife, funding um, the preservation of the ocean. And then oh, right wow. now we're working with Anera again with the collection called We Are Home. So, so you started, started the company, you know, started, of course, um, it's midst of in between like Lebanon and, and Canada, then you moved to New York. Like what, when you came to New York, um, because it's different, you know, it's different doing business, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. When you come to New York, because there's so many, there's so many people, there's so much competition. Um, did you find it an easy transition coming to New York? Was it an easy transition? I mean, when I came here, I came here because my husband's company was like, kind of acquired-ish. To another company and mm -hmm. he came with his team and I came with him but I'm a Canadian citizen Lebanese Canadian my passport is Canadian and I wasn't able to work here so in the beginning for slow factory I had to wait six months to be able to you know start all over again in a way to like find my you know to have a visa status to register the company and to do everything properly so that I can actually also have the ability to work here so it took a while. So then when I did that, then it started to grow mm -hmm. and blossom. So I did take a break, if you want, from the time that I got here until the time that I got my papers and my pad and my visa and everything to... And then since, when I did in May 2013, everything started to go super fast from then. Mm -hmm. But I was very impatient all the way till May. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so was it easy? So was it... Was it that easy coming to New York for you? Like once you got here, was it, I mean, was it just a breeze of... No, it was hard. Yeah. I had this theory, it was my second time moving here, right? Because I moved here in 20, 2008, 
then I moved back here in 2013 for good, hopefully. And um, uh, I have this theory that New York swallows you and spits you a stronger person, really. Wow. And I've seen all my friends who moved here also go through hell, really hell. Like it's a hard city. It's mm. very difficult to make it in New York, I think. And it was difficult. It was so hard. I went through so much and grew so much and I've learned so much. I know it sounds cheesy, what was but it was very What was probably hard. one of the one of the one of the situations in the very beginning of having to adjust to New York again? What was one of the what is one situation that either it was gonna make you or break you? So I got here and then I was like, I need a visa right away. So I took a job as a user experience designer, mm -hmm. even though I didn't want to. And I got I started working there and the first two days I told my husband I want to quit. This is no, it's not for me. I don't believe in their mission. It's fake. I don't want to work for them and I want to quit. I want to quit. He's like, give them a chance. You just got there. You're very you know, impatient. Just give them a chance. All my friends were telling me the same thing, but my heart was telling me quit, quit, quit. On that Friday, they fired me. It was the first time in my life I've been fired. First time. I was so shocked that when I left, I started bleeding. My nose was bleeding. Like, like I was literally shocked. How many days were you working there? Five days! And I knew from day one, <laughs> I what? This is not for me. And I, everyone was like, be patient, give them a chance, and then I got fired. But it was a blessing in disguise because A, I don't ask for people's advice anymore. Mm. B, no, it was a lesson for me to listen to my spirit, my instinct, whatever you want to call it. You got to listen to this thing because of course you're going to get hurt otherwise. But it was a good lesson, now I know. And two, it was a great lesson for me because I got into a big depression after that. I just dove into depression. I was just like, <laughs> that's it. And I don't know why it got me so strongly, but it did take me a long time to rise up from there and think and really be strong and be in you know see it as a blessing but it needed to that's my explanation yeah. but it really i needed to you know drive my ego into a wall mm. to really 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 understand that i have to look within and really find my my strength and then when i did that then I realized, all right, I'll find a way to get a visa. I don't need to work for somebody. I'm gonna get a visa without working for somebody. So that's how I started understanding immigration laws and this and that. And well, we have something in common. You have, we, we have this one thing in common. So I just moved here, so tomorrow will make three months. Oh, July the 9th will make three months. <laughs> but when I got here, within the month, I got hired. And I got fired in four days. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And? It was sitting right here. <laughs> it was sitting right here. And I never had been fired before. Me neither. In all my 25 years of, of, of living, uh, one fourth of a century, never had been fired until I got here to New York. And it, and it, and it, and it, it made me question myself, but, the great thing, and it, it, it speaks back to me, but the great thing is you, you had something to fall back on, which was your heart and what you created out of your mind, which was Slow Factory. And it was the same thing, you know, with having false image. And I had something to fall back on doing the podcast and then, you know, knowing, you know, knowing what to do and everything else like that. And, you know. That's so, good. Congratulations. Yeah. You see? Yeah, I mean, so I really think New York is... It, it's a creative energy and it attracts all these creative people not because for no reason it, it mm -hmm. is there is like this mm, sort of a tornado of energy here yeah. that forces you like a mecca of creativity that really forces you to be you mm -hmm. to be you yeah. unapologetically you you know what I mean mm -hmm. and once you are that then the things open up for you yeah. and it's it's hard because we are taught not to be us you know we are taught to please we are taught to follow the rules we are taught to do whatever they tell us to do never in our education do we teach us to 
know ourselves and to be ourselves. They don't teach us that. And we have to discover it. And then, I don't know. I'm trying to think. There was this book I was reading, and it was, uh, or, or an article, it was saying when, you, when you're in school, um, people, or not even in school, but in life, you know, people ask you what you want to do, and you tell them, and the, their next question is like, well, how are you going to make money off of it? Um, it's never looking at it in a way that how, the work that you do is slow factory and creating products, and also at the same time having a mission and purpose behind it. You're serving, you know, looking at every opportunity and looking at every different angle within the world as first serve the universe and then the universe is going to do this the exact same thing and come back to you and it's going to serve whatever you need in mind at that particular time so it's always like we're always taking an opportunity and looking at it in a way that okay let me figure out how to make so much money off of it and then we immediately like you say we transition ourselves to following the guidelines and if we know how we're going to make money off of it that we put ourselves in a box just for paper, just for paper, anything else in a sense of so it's yeah. <laughs> no, I mean yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. I how do you come so so even with like the scarves and it, and it has a uh, mission and purpose in mind. Like how do you come up with like the themes for each one or whatever like that? Mm. Um, um, okay, so I always start with a mission. Sorry, I always start with a mission that is close to my heart. So. The environment was one of them. I grew up in the 80s. I feel the guilt of growing up in a world that's bro broken, you know, and we want to do something. We want to do something bigger. And, uh, you know, and so that's why I wanted to work with the World Wildlife and then, you know, also yeah. have the overview effect that is a mental cognitive shift that happens to astronauts when they look at the earth for the first time when they are in space and they see it in you know floating in space literally in, in this harsh environment that is the universe and um, and they realize that we are all in this together they really feel the oneness with the universe and it's like almost a spiritual revelation and that was my quest with that is still my quest with slow factory that's why i call this collection we are home i feel each collection brings me closer and closer to um the mission of what it is and so um, you know it's very political I just go with my instinct I don't have an agenda I literally go with my instinct yeah so you talked about you work with the uh, it was the world wildlife worldwide life wildlife wildlife how do you gauge um, I guess how do you gauge with working with, you know, picking what organizations to work with and then also we talked before, uh, before we start recording everything else of, of all the different, you know, things that's going on in Lebanon and we were talking about some other stuff or whatever. Um, how do you gauge on continuing on like keeping everything on track with what you have in your mission and purpose and then having to look at the tv screen look on your look on your phone look on your timeline and then there's another big situation that people are going going through in like different countries and especially like lebanon mm -hmm. and syria and stuff like that um so when I wanted to work with, um, you know, help with the situation in the Middle East, the first collection we did was Gaza by Night and I was looking for NGOs to partner with and the first person I called was, um, you know, UNICEF and Save the Children and it was very difficult to, you know, get connected with somebody because these organizations are That's super okay. big. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it takes a long time to have a project, you know, come to life. And um, but I started talking around me and saying, I'm looking for some, you know, I'm looking for an organization to partner with. And it just started to come to me. So Anera was introduced to me. It was super easy to work with them. They are a small, agile team working on the ground in Lebanon, Gaza, Jordan, uh, Palestine, whatever, the West Bank as well, and um, and. Um, it was just easy. It was easy. It was. It was. 
you know, it clicked, it happened, we created the collection, we launched it within two, three weeks, which is super quick in the world of NGO. Same thing with the World Wildlife. I was talking, uh, I had this like idea, I want to work with them, I want to work with them, because I grew up like looking at the little panda, you know, the little panda is their logo, and thinking like, oh my God, they're saving the world. And I really had like this nostalgic feeling of, I really want to work with them. And I happened to talk to um, actually my mother-in-law, who was like, oh my gosh, I know someone who works there. And it was really like, Ash, I'm gonna call him. His name is David Love. He has the most beautiful last name in the world. <laughs> so David Love, he's a sweetheart, put me in touch with someone else, and then it happened so quickly also. And then it was like, oh my gosh, this is great. And then within two months, we had a collection. Mm. Um, so, and then for the third one, which is right now with the We Are Home collection, working for the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, I went back to Anera and I was like, let's work again together. They're like, yes. And so, that's I, I love the We Are Home because you're getting into jury now, and supposedly the the chain, the the, the key. And it's supposed to be a homage to where you used to your home. So yeah. the homage is that the tr the refugee tradition is to wear your key around your neck. Okay. I mean, it is not to wear it. It just happens. It's the way it is. When they leave, it came with the Palestinians. When they left and came to Lebanon or wherever they went, they had their keys around their necks. And so, if you look it up, it's like there's a lot of you know. Not a lot, it's actually very like, hard to find, but um, it's known <laughs> in our culture. Anyway, and so I always thought when I looked at Tiffany's, for example, you know, the keys, the Tiffany mm -hmm. keys, I always thought, oh my gosh, this is like, it has so much more meaning than this, than oh, open my heart or whatever. And so I wanted to do something about it. And I molded the key of my current home in Lebanon with the help of my sister, who's my partner in crime. And she was like, you know, doing it, manufacturing it in Lebanon, and with WhatsApp, she would send me pictures, and we would prototype it together. And then she FedExed me some options, and I choose whatever, and then that's how we work together. And um, and then we manufactured the key, and then we brought it to New York, and now I'm going to Lebanon to shoot a documentary with my sister, and it starts where we made those keys, and we road trip to the refugee camps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've done a great job. Uh, I've seen some of the campaigns where you raised uh, well over, uh, if not almost ten thousand dollars, you know, to support the women and you know the women exactly. refugee mm -hmm. in uh, in the Middle East. And also, I believe recently with the uh, WWF, mm -hmm. you, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you raised you know five thousand. Um, uh, we raised total fifteen, but. Most of it was in, um, we had to like donate a lot of scarves to them and to, so yeah. yeah. But it was hard, it was wonderful and it's hard I realize like, wow, what I'm doing is like fucking hard, really sorry to say the effort on your butt. <laughs> but it's like really, really hard and yeah, I, first. it's like, yeah. how to say, it's a struggle, it's a big struggle. Like yeah. right now with the refugees. Um, so how do you balance? Being a organization that creates products, but then por par uh, a portion of the funds that come back off of how much you make off those products that you make initially, uh, you're giving away partial of it to charitable organizations. But then at the same time, you still have to be on the positive end, which is not the negative end, you know, financially wise. Like, how do you balance? Like, how do you oh, balance it's so it out? Hard. It's very hard. It's we are almost like a non-profit. We are maybe thinking of either going as a B Corp eventually, like, because we br barely, barely break even. Barely. And, um, I mean, it's part of also running a fashion company. Um, lots of them, you know, I heard that Michael Kors had to file bankruptcy several times, you know, I mean, I, hear, I, I know the fashion industry is difficult, fashion industry plus, plus having like a cause tied to it and, and, and charity tied to it is extremely, um, almost like not logical, <laughs> but I think there is a model and we're dropping wholesale slowly because we want to focus on direct to consumer, we want to have a more flexible way to work with our prices mm -hmm. uh, so that we could manage to um, sustain that business and make it grow. Not make it grow so that I can, you know, 
on real estate but make it grow so we can create more products and I want to go into apparel I really really want to grow into apparel into shoes into bags and create them super um, ethically and sustainably and um, like I want to have a line of bags that's made out of pineapple leather and that has a crazy print on it pineapple leather mm -hmm. oh wow and I want to have um, you know uh, plastic bottles thread you know you could take the plastic bottles and the plastic from the ocean and transform it into thread and make jeans and apparel with it and work with bionic yarn for example which i would love to work with them but we have to have a certain minimum to be able to work with them so that's why we need to like grow we need to grow for us to make cool projects like this you know mm. wow so i so guess i answered it, what's yeah, next for slow factory yeah i mean the the extension you're trying to extend your you know your vision which also at the same time you're trying to do what you've always wanted to do for people in general which is you know have an impact but also uh massage your your artistic side as well of who you are as an individual but then there's this other side of you which you do, you have to, there's 24 7, 365, which is being a mother. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does being a mother influence your work? Um, and also, um, do you, um, are you going to bring your, your daughters uh, into the business at one point in time? <laughs> <laughs> force them but they are kind of part of my business because I made that studio here so that I can bring them whenever I need them to come here or if I can't have babysitting or whatever I mean I built that space so that they can always come there here right now they have a space for them they have you know their toys or whatever and um, my youngest you know she doesn't go to daycare she's with me all the time and she comes here she has her little like nook and bed and whatever mm -hmm. and um, they are part of my business they define you know my time I really log out at 3 34 I'm out I'm gone I'm like I'm not doing business around 4 p.m. and I disconnect completely I can take a few calls here and there if, if I have to but I really um, I'm in charge of my own schedule mm -hmm. and then when I put them to bed around 8 30 uh, I go back to work <laughs> and my work is constant and because I'm passionate about it not because I'm complaining I love it I think about it all the time I you know I sometimes have sleepless night because I'm just thinking and having ideas and writing things and both my husband and I work sometimes like through the wee hours of the morning because we're just like oh my gosh it's so cool and we're just working and then and we manage to have a balance between life and you know family and career and um, you know all these things even you know we have to find time to also go out and do things on our own and it's a it's balancing this whole thing yeah it's hard but it's also very you know inspiring for me that I'm like I, I'm so more I'm so much more productive now that I'm a mom because I have such a short time to work mm -hmm. so like I don't Facebook during that time I'm just like work 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 and then I know at 4 p.m. I'm like I have to go pick her up okay sometimes I have babysitters and stuff because I really want to keep on going mm -hmm. but um, I disconnect I have to like stop and yeah. then part of stopping is like when you're on you're fully on you know like uh -huh. I take it so seriously I'm so focused I work and then that allows me to disconnect also yeah well I think for one uh, the the obstacles uh, and the certain situations that you have overcome been able to overcome in your time uh, so far and I want to continue to encourage and hope that you continue to go over, you know, and get over the hump, as 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 they say, personally and also business-wise. And I think uh, what Slow Factory is doing, I think, is amazing. Um, it's tackling on, you know, things, and you don't have to. And that's the beauty of it. Like these are things that you don't, you necessarily don't have to. You can just wait until you get older, as a lot of people do, to take upon a role of being. Uh, wanted to have a voice uh, but you've developed your voice time and time and time again and you're only what did you say 21 
No, I'm just kidding. Stop. <laughs> so I'm, I'm do... so happy I'm not in my twenties anymore. Oh wow, wow. Well, I'm gonna. I hope I stay here as long as, as long as. <laughs> but I do thank you, uh, Miss uh, Celine, uh, for oh. joining from Celine from the Slow Factory. So I thank you for being on the False Image Fashion Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you.